back again. Um, to take a look at the wheel rotation, we're just gonna extend our gear again. So let me just quickly go in here. It's gonna be gear extend and gonna open the center doors as well. Uh, don't care for the absor absorbers right now. I'm gonna put the plane back to the ground. So come on down. I'm gonna take the rotation control for the ground and just put the tail wheel down and really the tail wheel should be extended for that as well there it is so that's that's that um, to make things a little more clear I'm gonna turn off our hardware texturing actually I could just switch to wireframe on shaded and let me just take the planes master control and I'm gonna move it forward in its local Z direction. And as, as you can see, as soon as I drag on the plane, um, the wheel is gonna start to rotate. And if, I, if I'm moving faster, the wheel is actually gonna move faster. And if I'm slowing down, the wheel is gonna stop. So that rotation, as I said, is calculated automatically within its local Z space. So when I rotate this runway uh, controller, uh, this rotation will still be correct. So if I move the plane, everything's gonna be all right. Uh, if I rotate the plane itself off to the side, and let me do that in a more extreme way, uh, this thing is not gonna move in Z anymore. So as you can see, the wheels are pretty much stuck since there's a little bit of rotation, they still move. If I put that to minus 90, nothing is gonna happen. So in the end, um, there's only two ways that you're using a runtime expression. Think about a different trick, uh, which I haven't thought about. Uh, use another software, although they, they all have that problem. So you're pretty much just stuck with Houdini to, to actually um, kind of solve that in a convenient way where no no uh, baking is involved. Um, things like that are always a problem. So uh, if I move the plane back to its origin because it's easier to work that way. And so um, the local Z transformation of that plane is basically factored into the wheel rotation. So as I said, we're gonna take a look at the node editor now. And before we start things, I just noticed that I, well, kind of like broke my own naming convention. So um, you can see that all those tabs are labeled as tab by me. You don't actually ha have to do that. You can just ca can call it flap aileron uh, without the tab and it's okay. I had this problem in some Maya version before where it kind of like complained that something else was named the same as my tab, uh, which shouldn't happen really, but uh, it led to it being kind of wonky. So I'm used to just adding the tab to make extra sure that uh, there's no naming conflict. There shouldn't be actually because those those things are just tabs in the window. But yeah, something didn't work back then. So it's kind of like, well, it, it, it will probably not be a problem. Uh, but yeah. Um, so to keep things uh, consistent, I'm going to call those things the same since I called the majority of them tab I'm gonna go pilot attach tab and sim let me do that Maya pilot attach tab and enter you gotta be really careful on when you press enter in those windows so sim attach sim attach to rig tab enter so thank you Maya um, just a bit bit more consistent so I'm gonna dock that here because it just makes things a bit easier to see. Um, and I'm gonna hide the channel box for now. So let's take a look at the uh, wheel rotation tab. So that's actually, that looks complicated, but that is pretty simple actually. So there's not a lot of things you need to calculate a wheel rotation along one axis. So the very first thing you have to find out 
is uh, the circumference of your wheel. So you can either calculate it by using uh, the radius or um, the diameter of, of your of your wheel or you can measure it which is what I did so I'm just going to show you that quickly uh, because um, that might come in handy for you at some point so that's actually offset from the rear wheel but that doesn't matter right now um, this is just a spline circle which has a measurement node attached so this is actually just giving me the value of the circumference of that wheel and the same thing exists for the tail wheel. So I get two values to tell me um, how, uh, how much length there is actually around the wheel. So it's circumference. So let me hide that again. We don't need to see them. Um, they are here. So this thing that's measuring the wheels is called an arc length. Uh, tool and um, this is using basically the rotation of uh, or um, I mean let me rephrase that uh, this is getting me the uh, the circumference of a of a wheel so um, So, sorry, I, I was just a little bit confused there because Maya was hiding a node that should be actually within that tab. So I expanded shapes here and um, found my arc length tool for the main wheel and for whatever reason it was removed from that node graph, which sometimes happens, shouldn't. Um, so uh, this is connected to that. So I was just wondering where that went because that would have brought me a whole calculation. So it's there now and I, hopefully it stays there now. So it's pinned, so it shouldn't move. Um, yeah, that's that. So don't disconnect that, Maya. Um, so I do have this arc length main wheel shape and this arc length tail wheel shape. Uh, so basically I'm calculating uh, the length around the, uh, the main wheel and the tail wheel is just going to be a fraction of that. So the tail wheel will have to spin a little bit faster than, um, than the main wheels to make the same way. And without going into much detail. So basically I'm just calculating based on the current Z value. So this is all not scaled. So this is just world space. This is in this case, one unit is one meter. So this is all being done. Uh, this, all these calculations are done in meters. So basically what I'm doing, I'm getting the actual Z position. I'm going to divide that by the actual circumference of the wheel. So I know how often that wheel, the length of uh, that wheel basically will fit into that distance, which basically gives me a value. So I know how often I have to rotate that wheel um, to fit into that distance. So basically, whenever I drag this, the Z value is going to go larger. Um, the node graph here will gonna calculate uh, how often that wheel fits into this distance, calculate a lumber, multiply it by 360 degrees to give me a, a rotational value in degrees. And at the end, after having uh, calculated that, so that's that. Um, and this float constant is what is actually multiplying those values by 360. Um, in the end, this rotation is gonna be applied to the wheel. So this rotation that is being calculated is gonna to go to the wheel L master, the wheel R master and tail wheel, uh, which as I said, will be a uh, multiple of that, uh, of the main wheel rotation because the tail wheel is just smaller. So it's basically, um, so it's basically gonna have to rotate faster. So um, that's that. Um, there are some more controls on the wheel controls and I haven't shown the wheel controls actually before. Um, there's actually not much to see there. Um, there's a few things that I could hide because you will never... So actually I've not hidden a bunch of stuff that should be hidden because actually that, that control is not meant to be moved. So. I can just go in here and hide all of that because we don't need to see that. And um, 
you will see that I have the ability to put the wheel to manual rotation. In this case, I can use this manual rotation value to, to animate the wheels. And by animating that from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0, I can actually go from my calculator rotation to a rotation that I'm inputting here uh, by keyframe. So whenever the plane has left the ground, and I want to pl the wheels to slowly stop. I will basically just go from my uh, from my uh, calculator rotation to manual rotation. I'm gonna um, have to be careful about those rotational values because I have to match them at the frame that the rotation is gonna go from uh, the the auto rotation to the manual rotation but it's not that much work so, so you can do that so um, the question is whether you even need to so if you're this far from the plane um, you probably won't see whether the wheels are still spinning when they're back retracted back into the gear well but um, if I am close to the plane and I want to slowly stop the wheels from spinning I can do that um, I'm being displayed the auto rotation. Uh, so this this these two values is just a display. So they are displaying me the actually uh, currently calculated value of the auto wheel rotation. So uh, on that frame where I'm going from from manual to or where I'm going from auto to manual, I can match those two values, keep them the same for a short period of time, and then just slowly animate that to a stop. So the wheel will keep its rotation. And um, yeah, that's basically gonna stop the wheel now. So as I said, that's pretty simple math. Um, as I said, you don't want to probably avoid the runtime expression if you don't want to bake things down. The other way to do a rotation calculation is, no, Maya, I don't want to work on that joint. The other way to do rotation calculation is um, to have that plane, if it's on the ground, to have it move along a spline. So you can attach an object to a spline and you can get that spline's length. So you can basically get that, that spline's length and then calculate real rotation based on that length instead of uh, just the z-axis. Um, you would have, uh, but you, you have it in all, do, would have to do that in all cases, kind of like the offset of the wheels from the middle of the plane. But in the end, um, that difference will be so small that you can't see it. So if you have the plane taxiing on the ground, you don't want to get into runtime expressions, you might want to think about just attaching it to a path and then using that path to calculate the rotational value of your wheel. In that case, you can make turns uh, on the ground and everything will just work. Um, as I said, I, I didn't do that because my plane was not going to taxi on the ground. So if I had a shot where this would actually taxi from the ramp uh, via some taxiways to the runway, I probably would have chosen to go with a path because it's also easier to animate than to do it manually. Um, in this case, I could also um, attach that, uh, that rotational control of the tail wheel to that path so it will follow or look a little bit ahead and based on the curvature in front of it will decide whether it has to go this or that way. So that, that all can be done. Uh, as I said, that wasn't needed in that case, but these are all things that might be needed for for other cases, for other uh, for other shots. So um, that's uh, that's it basically for the wheels. And um, for the rest of the video, before we go into rendering, I just quickly go through here because um, for the people in my course and at the lab, uh, you can take a look at the file. For everyone else, I, I'm sure there would be a lot of diff uh, interesting things uh, in here for some of you. But in the end, this, is, uh, this video is already running for a long time. So I'm just going to go quickly go through that. Uh, because um, after all these explanations before, I, th I think sh sh things should be kind of obvious how they're probably built. So in the end, it's always just some, some MARF nodes and some connections. So um, let me do that really quickly. And uh, after that, we're going to switch to uh, shading, which might be a little more exciting for some of you people uh, that do not want to go into rigging, but are interested in uh, maybe uh, shading a plane. So. That's that. Let's uh, 
take a look at the rest of the controllers. So I'm just gonna go through a few simple tabs here. So we already took a look at them. So this is just attaching the pilot. No, this is attaching the sim to the rig. So this is attaching the pilot to the rig and coming back to the sim. Uh, that reminds me that before we were taking a look at shading, I actually um, wanted to take a little detour to buy first actually, because this plane has a little simulation set up that is basically some fire and some smoke for for the engine start. So we, since I definitely don't have the time to, to have a complete Bifrost overview, um, we we'll still take a look at that because while this is not normally part of a rig, this is, this is a simulation, but um, it was easy enough to integrate um, as a little gimmick to, to the thing and you can actually choose on which frame the engine starts and the fire and smoke will adapt so you basically give it a frame uh, where the engine where the propeller starts to really spin and ramp up and the engine starts and there will be smoke and fire coming out of the engine so it's a little neat uh, bifrost exercise um, well Bif bifrost is still a new tool set so I normally you do that in Houdini uh, most likely but yeah um, so before we go into shading uh, later we will take a look at that because I think that's uh, this is a VFX course after all so there should be some smoke and fire probably so yeah um, let's go back here we're not going to look at the shader control tab scoop door control easy connection uh, wing band tab actually interesting but not that complicated so there's a bunch of attributes uh, as I said on the on the wing controller let me just quickly pu pull that up here. Um, there's a bunch of attributes and, and let me just declutter things here a little bit. So that's, let me rearrange that. So yeah, that's probably better. Um, doop, and let me turn off the wireframe on shaded here and let's go, yeah, let's leave it at that. So, um, this is just the wing band control so we have those uh, those custom attributes as i said the the flutter scale etc etc these are all connected to um the uh, deformers on that on that thing so basically they just calculating based on your input uh value right here they're basically just scaling those input values to some values that the deformer can work with so if you put in a three it's a convenient value for you but it might be a 0 0.015 for the deformer so i'm basically just converting converting un units here um to give you the user a good range of numbers to work with while the deformer expects a different range of numbers so um, there's a little expression right here for the tail uh, of the plane so um, actually there's two expressions because uh, both noise uh, noises that are moving the wings are done via, ex via expressions so yeah I'm just gonna quickly go into that one and if we expand that here, we will see that all those things that are used here, so uh, the wing band control, flutter frequency is multiplied by the uh, by the frame number and it's multiplied by the wing band control, wings flutter scale, etc, etc. So basically I'm just cal calculating a little bit of noise based on some some inputs here so I can change that noise with attributes. And this is going into that wing band float math. Um, because it's added to uh, the value of the of the um, of the wing band actually, so I have to add them together. This noise layer and this actual um, fixed deformation, and yeah, that's going out to the deformers uh, which are doing their thing and bending the the wing. So prop tab already spoke about the prop wheel rotation we just had that tail steering tab simple connection um, rudder tab simple thing elevator tab simple thing ground control tab that's actually probably a bit more complex so I'm, I'm not gonna go too deep into that so basically based on the rotation of this um, this ground controller here so if I rotate the plane 
it's basically calculating uh, where the ground is, where to stop the plane. It's um, adding a few um, few noises. So these are these expressions here, uh, which are added in. So as I said before, the ground has a little bit of noise. The plane itself has a bit, little bit of noise. So the plane and the ground can can kind of like push against each other to give some variation in uh, the jumpiness of, of the plane on the ground. So basically, this is just just adding in all this stuff and then basically um, putting it out to to uh, uh, all those little things uh, here on the rig. So uh, uh, one thing that might be interesting here that I didn't use before, uh, I used expression to generate the noise here. Uh, in this case here, which is just um, adding a little noise to that uh, that gear hydraulics uh, group right here. So it's basically adding a little noise to um, to the shock absorbers on the ground. Um, that noise is actually calculated with a texture node. So this is nothing uh, else than a standard Maya noise node. So as you would use it for shading purposes, this is a classic Maya noise, not an, not an Arnold node or something like that. So it's just a simple Maya noise, but you can basically use it in the same way as you would use an expression. So I kind of like, I don't know why I decided to use that here in this case, uh, instead of an expression. Uh, they do tend to look a little, uh, they're a little easier on the eye in the node editor because uh, they don't have any cyclic connections. So they're a little bit more manageable, which is why I like to use them. Um, so basically, if you put in uh, time as an input, you're getting time variant noise. So this is the time one node uh, from Maya. Uh, this will usually be connected to a lot of things. So basically, every animation curve that you have and anything else, um, will be uh, implicitly connected to that time one node. You can't see every connection to that time one node unless you ask Maya to explicitly uh, display them. But this time node, uh, time one node is always there. So by taking its value and multiplying it by another value, I can slow down time. This is fed to this node, so I can slow down or speed up that noise. Um, this is looking up the texture at a uh, uh, UV coordinate uh, right now of zero zero. I could actually put in a manual UV coordinate here because for this noise, all I need is basically one pixel of that of, of that texture that is being generated. So I'm just asking it, what's your value at coordinate zero zero? And because this is animated noise, that value will will uh, vary between zero and one, and this value will be put out by the out color. So I'm just using the, the, the green channel here. I could use the red, I could use the blue. This is black and white noise, uh, grayscale noise. This is, they are all the same value. And they are being fed into the hy hydraulic up down. So that's that. And the other thing that is being controlled by the ground push control uh, is of course based on its, on its, uh, on its height, um, like that. Um, the deformers, so the FFDs that are actually deforming the wheels here, um, are basically basically animated. So um, this uh, these nodes are controlling the envelope of the FFD deformer. So the envelope is uh, something that can be. Uh, connected to other attributes. So um, basically this is just the weight of the deformer. So if the envelope is zero, the deformer will not have any of effect on the object. If it's one, it will have its full effect on the object. If I hook that all up, uh, I've done that through an animation curve here, basically um, hook that up to some other attribute. In this case, basically whether that ground push control is at zero or at 0 0.06. So basically it's blending, in this range, it's blending between deformer on, deformer off, so zero and one. So that's that. Um, you can take that apart if you're in the course and have the file, uh, take a look at that. There's some probably interesting things in there. Otherwise it looks complicated, but it's not that complicated. It basically just looks complicated because those expressions are making all those connections messy, but the, otherwise it's pretty straightforward. Um, flap aileron tab, nothing complicated here, just some math, some, some gyre, direct connection, tail gear control, 
simple as that. Um, gear control, uh, also really, really, really easy. So this is actually the control for, um, and I might, before taking a look at it, I might take a look at the canopy control and that's also pretty simple but there's a special thing here that we haven't talked about before and this is kind of like the last tangent i want to go off to and show you in a different maya file and that is driven keys and basically a nicer way to use driven keys than maya standard way uh, which can be discussed if it's the right way to use animations curves or, or if you ho should hook up things that way um, but i like to use this this method because it's easy and it gives me much more control over things. Uh, so I'm gonna explain that quite quickly. And I know a lot of people do it that way. Um, yeah, so um, maybe you can already see that. So all of these graphs have something in common. And that is basically the control input is being fed through a unit to time conversion node to an a curve node so this is actually a Maya curve node this is what you create when you're animating and attaching a, or a setting keyframes Maya is in the background going to create a curve node which just exists in the scene as a node as any other thing so you can actually use that in the node editor and if you're animating it's going to create that node it's going to hook it up to time and uh, yeah basically that's giving you the animation so you can see uh, it it's not connected to time but it things it's connected to time um, so basically those are the keyframes so um, I could actually look at this this thing in the animation editor and I would actually see um, the, the curve there and I could manipulate it um, so basically what these things are doing is there I have animated a complex set of motions over time so basically usually from frame 0 to 100 and then instead of using time to control all those animations, I'm using an attribute on an object that goes from zero to 100 to kind of like, uh, instead of using time, replay that animation on slider movement. So um, that is the concept of driven keys, but in a little bit different way. So um, as you can see, there's uh, always this unit to time conversion, this unit to type conversion node, which Meyer creates automatically you pretty much can't uh, can't have it any other way if you're using animation curves that way because they're expecting a time input and this this float that is going out here is uh, technically not a, a, a time value in uh, for Maya um, so it's gonna get converted they are a bit annoying because really you wouldn't need them so basically there are animation curves in Maya that can accept a float or a double input um, that uh, do not require you to to have this time conversion uh, at the front but uh, that they are generated is kind of like based in the way that i've created these animation curves so i can't do anything about it they're a bit annoying it would be great if for for example um, those unit to time conversion or unit conversion nodes in general are also generated if you're feeding a float value into a rotational value um, or using float math to um, um, modify rotations uh, you can't you, you you can add use an old double at double linear node to, to do that without the conversion but uh, seriously those float math nodes are much much more modern and uh, work way better than the old way and are much less confusing because they do less but they do simple things very good so unfortunately Sometimes Maya will have to insert those unit conversions. So that's why they are here. They haven't been created by me. So Maya did this for me. And I'm going to show you in the famous second Maya instance um, what that's all about and how these things came to be. So as I've said before, we're going to reuse our... Um, control example file that we've saved before. So I'm gonna go back to that and I'm just opening it because I said we'd use it again because actually um, we're gonna throw away everything that's in here because we don't need it. Instead we want to build another kind of control. So 
just as in sim a simple example, let, let me just build a cube, move it off to the side here, create another cube, and basically we want this cube to control this cube in some uh, way that is not a linear direct connection, but rather um, if the cube is up here, this cube is going to go up here, and if the cube moves farther up, this cube is going to go down again. So the thing uh, that you would normally um, use for that is a concept called driven keys, which is basically creating function curves that are not connected to time, but to another object. So let me, um, let me just uh, set some keyframes on that thing right now. So I'm just going to animate, or maybe not. Uh, I think the concept is more clear if I uh, don't do that. So break the connection. And now I do have an empty curve somewhere there. Go away. So, um, uh, it's better to delete those things on, on, on that, if you don't do those, those curves that you've broken the connection to are tend to pile up, uh, in your scene. It's not really that they take much space, but well, they don't have to be there if they're not used anymore. So, um, so, uh, I'm just going to create a relationship between those two things and the, the, and the way, um, I usually go about this so we want to animate translate translate y is uh, set driven keys or just driven keys so basically this is the driven object this is gonna be modified by another object and I'm gonna load uh, this cube as a driver and I'm uh, gonna um, make a relationship between their two translate y value so they're currently at the the origin or basically in, in y direction they're on zero so I'm gonna set a key and uh, now I'm gonna move that cube up and move that key this this cube even further up and I'm gonna set a key again so there's still this relationship between the two objects and I'm gonna take that cube and move it even further up and I'm going to take that cube and move it even further down. So I'm going to press key again. Boop. And if I now move that cube, we will see that the other cube is doing basically pretty much what I told it to do based on my keyframe inputs. So um, you can see that uh, this cube's translate white value is uh, blue. So that means it basically is connected to another object. The um, Good thing about this is that you can actually see that relationship in the graph editor. So if I select that cube, um, this axis, the time axis, which is usually the time axis, is not going to be the time axis anymore. The other, the, 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 what is usually the time axis now is the translate y value of the other object. So let me just um, go to this point here, which is right around where this thing is at its top, um, if I change that animation curve, I can chill, still change, like it, if it was an F curve uh, that is connected to time, I can change their input. So basically, I could go in there and say, yeah, well, it's going to start at the top and it's just going to go down and maybe it's going to have a, a little bump here, so it's going to come to a rest at the middle of the animation. So now if I move that thing, the other cube is going to stop way up here. If I move it down, it's going to stop for a little bit and then move down again. So what? Whoop. So that's what I build with this kind of relationship. Um, this is great, but um, I don't really like the set driven key window and the relationships are not that clear. Once you have your animation curve, it's easy to modify it. Um, but it kind of feels unnatural because oftentimes the, the, the connection that you want to build is still time based. So basically you're looking at a, a procedure from the real world which is based over time and you now want to take that procedure or, it, or these 
different kinds of animations or things that are uh, working in parallel and you want to hook them up to some other control um, to later only animate that control over time. So what do I mean by that? Let us delete those cubes. Let us create a cylinder. Uh, and I'm just gonna do that pretty quickly. So um, yeah, uh, let's say there's another cylinder in there. Um, make that a child of the other one. Let's create uh, even more cylinders because they're great. Uh, let's say that's a maybe a wheel or something like that. So that's that. That is going to be a child of this other thing here. So three cylinders. I'm not going to bother renaming them right now because this is just about the, the, the concept. Uh, and I'm going to add a, another cube and I'm going to move it to the top here. Make it a little bit smaller, broader thing, whatever. I'm going to delete that. I'm going to inset that face. So I'm going to go extrude offset. Uh, do it that way and then I'm just gonna come on and extract uh, that face so what do we have here so let me move that off to the side so let's say we want to center the pivot on that one and we want to move that thing over there so basically we've just built a gear well that looks not very pretty but we don't care. So um, I'm just going to move the pivot of this thing up here. So this is basically our gear. Ah, let me move that up a little bit farther. So um, this is our gear. It's going to retract. And there is this thing that is a... Okay, I, I should rename some things. Because, uh, yeah. So Shift-P, um, delete all history because we don't need that so that's the gear well door that's uh, the gear well frame um, that's the wheel so it kind of comes clearer what I want to do so that's the wheel that's the lower lower strut uh, upper strut uh, I'm gonna save that over so yeah that's that so um, we have something that we want to animate over time. So let's say this thing is starting here. So I've taken a look at the reference footage and over the course of a hundred frames, there was, this will probably be more in nature, but let's say we're going to use a hundred frames because that makes things much easier, but I'm going to show you how you can do it differently at the end. So we do have the range one to 100, which is a hundred frames. So that that's cool. I, I, I sometimes start at zero because really the slider that I'm gonna animate later is gonna animate from zero to one hundred. So you might start on zero for, for this kind of thing. You don't need any pre-run or something like that. It just makes things easier. So let's say I know that uh, after a second, so we're on 24 here, so that's 24 frames. After a second, this, this gear door is extended so I'm just gonna um, um, actually ro rotate or animate only the things that I need because it makes hooking up things later much easier so let's say on frame 24 that thing is fully open we saw that in reference footage so this is opening uh, on frame 17 that thing uh, is gonna start around rotating around its, its x-axis and let's say that's finished on frame 66 because that's just the timing that we extrapolated it's completely arbitrary right now but but that could be and, and let's say at frame 55 um let's move that up here actually let's say on frame 55 this strut thing is gonna slowly extend until it's done extending on frame 100 and let's say that thing oh did i ah 
I animated the rotate. That's wrong. So I didn't want to do that. Let's say 55. So it's translate Y. So it's on that and on frame 100 it's down here. Could have turned on auto key but I didn't. So let's say that's the thing that uh, our our plane is doing when it's extending its gear. Um, so um, that's a pretty nice animation. Uh, but now in my shot I don't want to have this animation all the time and then go in here select everything and gonna take all those keyframes and move them or something like that instead i want to have some control over how fast this happens because you usually don't want to, things to happen as fast as they do in reality on the film but rather um i want to have a control object and i'm gonna create some control thingy here so it's gonna be a circle again because so this control thingy is gonna be nah. okay it's gonna be it's, just, it's, it's gonna be here so that's that's the control thingy so we're gonna give it some color just because because um not an outline of the color but rather this thing here so that's gonna be yeah it's gonna be yellow now so yeah, and let's make this a little bit thicker. Done. So uh, freeze that. Don't need to, but I want to. So let's say this thing is our gear control, and we're not gonna use any of these controls because we don't need them. The only thing this is gonna have, um, and I'm gonna call that gear control. The only thing this is gonna have is a custom attribute that is called gear extend um, and it's gonna start at zero it's gonna be a maximum of a 100 and that's it we're gonna have a slider in the attribute editor so this thingy here and we will also see it in the channel box so i can select that thing and just use my virtual slider in the viewport by pressing the middle mouse button which is probably one of the most handy tools in Maya and I actually love that a lot of programs implemented differently I really like that and Maya is not really famous for good UX design so yeah that's that so yeah mm. that's the thing I want to do how do I connect this up to this time-based animation well the node editor is going to help us with that. So I've got this node editor docked down here and I actually want to redock it because it's handy there. So let's say this is it and I want to see everything I've animated. So that's jumbled mess. Maya. <sighs> Don't pin them. So there they are and i have really no idea why maya gives me the light linker and everything else i could turn it off but it really shouldn't do that in this case let me just do this differently i'm gonna pull in all the nodes that are actually animated so i don't need well it's gonna give me them anyway and again so let me just graph seriously this is kind of this is kind of annoying sometimes. So I'm going to unpin them so they're not locked to their initial position. And uh, yeah, that's more like what I wanted to do. So I don't need the wheel. I didn't animate that. I don't need any of the shapes or the light linker or anything else. So um, what do we see here? So if we take a look at our gear well door and take a quick look at its F curves, you can see that it has an animation curve. Uh, that actually should be linear, but it depends on what you want to do. Um, I'm gonna keep it that way. So I have a little little smoothness here in the, in the movement. Might be, might be beneficial. Um, so let's say, um, this was our animation, so sorry, I closed that. So that's our animation, um, that's the other animation, and that's even the other animation. So that's the translate Y of the, the, the strut thing, that's the rotate of the upper strut, and that's 
this node is the rotate of the gear well door up here. So it's just standard animation curves. Um, every animation curve, if I just press free right here, has an input value. So usually they are hooked up to time because this is a time-based animation. I can scrub to the timeline. And of course there, these curves are somehow connected to time. Um, yes. Uh, Maya doesn't display that connection by default. Um, so I have my control and I definitely want to have my control in here. And I'm going to get rid of the shape and I'm going to call that gear control. Just a bit of advice. You really, really do want to create Maya. Uh, you really, really do want to create tabs for these kind of things in a complex, um, in a complex asset. If we take a look at the plane again, um, while this might look complex, that's quite an easy graph. So um, that's not even close to the complexity that you can build um, for, for example, for a, a complex character or something like that, or even a more complex uh, technical asset than this plane. So unfortunately, you can't comment things in the node editor. and Really, I'm not even going to comment on that, and that's pun is fully intended, Autodesk. Um, you can't. You just can't. Why you would not can, I don't know. Um, anyway, basically, these things are the only thing that you can basically name right here. Um, so you kind of have to use them to organize things around here because if you lose that that graph um, you will have to regraph connections on some of the objects uh, later on and you will probably have to if they are not pinned uh, which I did here you can press P and, and those, those nodes stay, will stay where they are if they are not pinned they when regraphing something they will just appear anywhere so Maya has no idea where those nodes were before or even where you might want to have them and sometimes they even will just show up bundled on top of each other so in the end um, that's a pretty inconvenient but yeah you you can uh, keep things organized by using those tabs and they won't break so if they are pinned they will stay there there are a few quirks here and there but um, once you're used to that system, they work. And it's actually quite efficient to work in that. Uh, there, there's a, some issues I have with the, with the graph editor, but in the end, uh, that's a pretty efficient workflow and pretty much more efficient in some other packages that, that use node-based workflows um, because this thing just works with everything in Maya. So um, yeah, that's kind of like the pros and cons of, of things. So uh, that's that. So... Um, what do I want to do? I have this gear control right here and I have my animation over time. So in the end, those animation curves are hooked up to time, but I don't want to have them hooked up to time. Instead, and I'm gonna connect this to this little white dot here and Maya actually displays me the attributes it does not want to show here. And that's the input attribute. Um, let me connect that to input and you will see what happens. There's a unit conversion nodes popping up somewhere and you might expect it to pop up here, which would be a good place to put it, but it, it's not. So yeah, you basically have to clean up a little bit if they were created. So this unit to time conversion is going to be created because this curve expects a time input and this uh, float output here is not technically a time output, but it will work. Um, it will work. So I'm going to do the same thing for the other animation curve right here. So we're going to uh, hook up to the input and I'm going to hook up to the input. And after having done that, I'm just going to clean up a little bit. They appear all in the same place because I'm currently pinned. Um, but uh, yeah, you can sh turn it off. I usually forget where it is actually because I, uh, that's here. Pin all nodes by default. You can turn it off uh, so they won't appear in very weird places, but only slightly weird places. But anyway, um, yes, 
And after that, you should press P because the next time you open that thing, that thing is going to be over there again, probably, sometimes, maybe, or your whole graph is going to be somewhere. Um, if they're pinned, as I said, it's okay. So, a um, little rant here, sorry, but sometimes those things are a little bit quirky. So, um, anyway, this is now not connected to time anymore. So as you can see, I basically destroyed my time-based animation. So where is it gone? Um, it's right there where I wanted to have it. And I'm going to use the slider now. If I move that slider now, that thing is going to do everything I ever wanted to do. So, plop, and the gear is going to extend. So I can go in here and say I don't want to animate this whole complex process of a range of 100 frames, but I need to happen, it needed to happen a little bit faster, so I'm gonna go to frame 80, put it to 100, done. So I have my whole complex animation uh, that I had before that was time-based, I've got it basically uh, compress down into an attribute, um, I can control with this attribute multiple things, the connections are pretty easy to view, and you can actually get rid of those time conversion nodes if you're not using the same type of animation curves and you can move things over to another type type of animation curves if you really want to. But um, as you can see, Maya put the animation curve I just created here, which is not that bad actually. Um, so, um, so yeah, um, that's, that's that and it works. Uh, as intended. So uh, basically I now have new control over my animation. So if I want to have the look that I had uh, when I originally created uh, those things, I, I've, I have two keyframes here. If I open the graph editor, you will see that this animation has slopes. So I have to put it to linear because um, the, the F curves here already have their slopes. Um, basically, I'd double slope it and double slow it down at the ends of the animation curves. Um, so basically dampen it uh, more than one time. But I can do that. So if I do want to change things around here uh, a little bit, I can do that. I can go in here and maybe even do something like that. So um, the gear is gonna um, overshoot a little bit. So basically it's gonna be at its full point here. Uh, it's actually not really doing much because the behavior above 100 is not defined, but I can maybe go in here and uh, have it go back um, when it's extending a little bit. So it's going to go open, close again, and then fully open. Uh, there's no reason why you'd want to have that on a playing gear, but you can do that now. So um, this gives you a lot of control. So the thing is, if I didn't want initially animate over the range of uh, frame uh, um, uh, 100, uh, 0 to 100, but maybe 200. So let me just quickly save that thing and I'm going to undo everything uh, we did since connecting our control to the thing, just to keep things a bit more obvious. So get rid of it. So Let's say I was on frame 200. So this thing is animated over time again. And I'm going to select everything that is animated here. Let's say this wasn't animated to frame 100, but rather frame 200. So I'm going to scale that here. So yeah, that's frame 200. What am I going to do? My attribute is going to go from uh, 100 to 200. Not much of a problem. I'm just going to do a float math here. And you will have to calculate your offset. If this was a weird uh, number like 267, you have to calculate your factor. But if I'm going to go here, hook up the gear extend, just multiply it by 2, the output will be 200. I'm just going to hook up the input here, input here and input here and magically the unit to time conversion nodes appear somewhere where it's not too bad. Wonderful. And um, that thing is now going to do its thing as I expect. As you can see, this was animated to 200, but I get the full extended uh, 
100. If this was a, another factor, you just have to calculate it and use it. But that's basically how you go about it. Um, a lot of people don't like those unit to time conversion nodes. I don't, I don't like them either, but in the end for um, the kind of fast workflow that I do have while setting this up, uh, I can live with them. So, so that's that. And that's basically how the controls for the gear and everything else. You know, save that again, might be interesting to keep that. Um, that's basically how the gear controls um, and some of the other controls like the canopy control uh, are set up. So um, at the beginning they were animated over time because a bunch of things are basically happening in parallel and it's just easier to animate with time. Uh, they were animated over time, like for example, that the, that the door here has a different motion and a different point of rotation as the uh, actual gear strut. Um, those those little um, connectors are set up with with uh, look uh, as look at. So basically, the thing is always going to uh, ori be oriented towards uh, the um, the hinge here, and this uh, cylinder is going to look at the hinge here. So um, they are basically always keeping uh keeping relative rotation to each other while the gear extends and uh so there's a few things that are um in uh, in connection with each other so in the end it was just easier to animate over time and then basically convert the whole thing um to a driven key like setup instead of um working with abstract driven keys so that's how i like to work it's how some people like to work probably not everyone um yeah but that's just a little thing i like to do for those kinds of driven key setup um so let me just quickly think about uh about it all um i think and I'm becoming pretty sure. Um, that's it. That's it for the for the uh, for the um, rig. So um, not gonna use the default material anymore. Anymore hardware texturing is gonna be on, and we're back to our initial state. Uh, I think I'm gonna reload um, the animated file now because uh, before we go into shading uh, let's look at the actual smoke sim a um, little bit of uh, fire and i'm gonna quickly look into bifrost and then we're off to shading 